Hi, my name is Dr. Nikita Visniak. I'm the Chair of Physical Medicine at the Boucher Institute. I'm also the Director of Professional Health Systems, which is a company that I started about 10 years ago where we write books for doctors and therapists on orthopedic testing, rehab exercises, basic palpation and anatomy, all the way up to TCM acupuncture and injection type therapies. We also offer continuing education seminar series and consulting services for a lot of practitioners around the world. Currently we're in about 40 countries right now, 40 or 50 countries. What you're about to see is an introduction to the Boucher Institute of Naturopathic Medicine Physical Medicine program. Our program is unique in the sense that we offer an integrated multidisciplinary approach to patient treatment and student education. So part of what this entails is when students are first learning their anatomy, they actually learn assessment at the same time as anatomy. So if you learn about the eye, we teach you how to do an ophthalmic exam. If you learn about the thigh, we teach you how to do exercises, physical exam, palpation, range of motion assessment, all of that right there when you learn about that part of the body. Eventually we work our way towards integrated advanced orthopedics and different treatment options associated with acupuncture, osseous manipulation, and a multitude of other therapies that are available. And the video you're about to watch is a brief introduction of that so we can see what the students at the Boucher Institute are learning and how they're progressing through different portions of the program. Thank you very much. All right, so I'd like to welcome you guys to the physical medicine space. This is Shaz, who you met downstairs. I'm uh, Dr. Visniak is the official title, but I often go by Dr. Nick. So basically my job here this evening is to kind of take you guys through the physical medicine program, what we do and how it's integrated in physical medicine. So for us, for when you learn anatomy, we don't just teach anatomy, we teach functional anatomy. So that means if I tell you about an arm, what do you learn? You learn about all the muscles of the arm, all the blood vessels of the arm, all the nerves of the arm, but we go right into assessment. How do I strengthen that arm? How do I stretch that arm? How do I take blood pressure from this arm? You learn about an eye, well, we don't just say these are the structures of the eye, we teach you right in anatomy one to do an eye exam, okay? You're learning about the ear, we look in ears right in anatomy one, just so you can physically see what those structures look like. So we already accelerate the learning process and clinical application of that information. All right, so obviously quick integration of information is one of the key things we do. The other thing that we're gonna do is talk about, well, palpation is one of the key things we do too. So I've taught at a number of uh, different programs and one of the key things that I like to do for anatomy program is, I'm just gonna put my hand on your shoulder for a second. We'll ask you guys eventually to give me a list of all the structures below my hand, okay? So when you're thinking as a medical practitioner, what are you going to do? You're gonna give a list of what are the potential differentials that could cause pathology in that patient, all right? I think if you went to speak to most doctors and therapists out there and ask them to give a list of structures below their hand right now, they might have a difficult time doing that, okay? It's a fundamental part of realizing what you do as a physician is working on the body, okay? Next thing we're going to talk about, I guess, will be uh, case-based learning. So ma mainly what we do is a lot of role play here. So what we'll do is role play uh, potential injuries and accidents and we'll just have you come up to the front of the class as a student and walk us through it a little bit on, based on the knowledge that you have at that time. Starting from anatomy to physical medicine to MANIP, so basically first year, second year, third year, fourth year, the level of education and demonstration of skill we expect is a little bit higher each time and eventually you get to the, the level that we have Shaz at right here. So. She'll be uh, doing a demonstration for you guys today on me. So you're not just sitting down the whole day, we'll actually get up and physically do something. All right, that's another key thing I like to make sure we do. And in fact, you saw today a student for a day. You won't be sitting in a desk the full time. What we'll do even for anatomy, if it's anatomy one and we're learning about the head and neck, we'll get up, we have 45, 45 seconds, I wish, okay? 45 minutes of lecture and then we'll get up and we'll go ahead and say, how do I do cervical range of motion? How do I assess an eye? How do I look into the back of the throat for an infection or anything like that? So there's less sitting time in this program than you typically see as well. How many people here have had anatomy before? Okay, how many people here are RMTs? Okay, okay, all right. So a lot of you have had anatomy before. Kinesiologists, anybody out there? Kines degrees, all right. So it kind of gives you an acceleration through a lot of the uh, phys med stuff that we do. Uh, but you might find it's a little bit different than you learn in kines and it's also a good review for you guys as well. So, you know, squat technique or what muscles you use for a given exercise or even just um, you know, common injuries that we see as well. All right, how many anatomy? Okay, that's good. I guess we should just jump right into our sample scenario right here. So I'm gonna be a patient who's gonna role play some type of low back pain injury. Shaz is a fourth year student. She's gonna take us through it as though she's the physician, I'm just the patient and away we go. Okay, all right. Hi, Dr. Nick. Hi, I'm so glad that you could fit me in today. Thank you very much, all right. My neck is a little bit sore, actually. Okay. Okay. What happened? Uh, I don't know. I just slept a little bit funny. Just today? Or yeah, just last night. Okay. Yeah. I was pretty nervous. A bunch of people I knew that I didn't know were going to be in the class, <laughs> and I was a little bit nervous about it. So. That's okay. Yeah. Pretend they're not there. Okay. All right. <laughs> and is there anything being done to make it better? 
Uh, no, it's just been kind of sore. I can't, there's Can nothing I've been Yeah, if I move certain ways, it feels worse. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so we're going to go through some range of motion on okay. your neck. Don't do anything that you think is going to injure you further. Okay. And just let me know like, where things are getting a little bit painful. Okay, thank you. So can I get you to flex your neck forward, down to the Okay. Floor? Yeah, it feels just a little bit tight when I do that. Okay. okay. Up to the side. Um, that's okay. Okay. Drop one ear. Feels tight on this side. Okay. Yeah. And then the other side. That feels okay. Good. Can I get you to look to the left? Okay. Good. And look to the right. Okay. Good. So I'm going to do the same range of motion, but I'm going to get you to sit down and face the crowd. Okay. Yes. All right. There. Okay, yeah, I don't see them. Okay, all right. You're okay with a hands on a Yep, that'd be great, thank you. Okay. How does it feel for the muscles? They feel kind of tight. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I actually have a bit of a headache from this side right here, going up and around too. So can I, I'm gonna take you through range of motion, let me do it. Okay. okay. It's a little bit too. Yeah. And we're gonna go down. Good. And then we're just gonna come back. Good. Okay. And can I get you to lay down? Okay. Face up, please. Face up, all right. Okay, so what I usually do is I start at C7, which is the lowest of the cervical spine vertebrae, walk my way up have a feel for what the bones are doing, and then go back down again, feel the articular pillars, see what muscles are tight, and right in there, there's something. Yep. How's that one there? Yep, same thing, tight on the left. Yep. So, do you want me to give the listing? I don't give the listing, but just uh, go ahead and just do it. Okay, Dr. Nick, have you ever had a cervical spine adjust? I have never been adjusted before. Okay, so when we adjust your neck, you will hear a loud popping sound. Okay, what is that loud popping sound? Uh, basically, it is a <laughs> buildup of nitrogen in the joint space, and those bubbles are released. So my bones are actually breaking when you hear no, that? No, your bones are just oh, moving okay. into the place that they're supposed to be moving. Oh, so it's like when I crack my knuckle. Absolutely. And that just closer to my ears, and that's why it sounds louder. Yes. Okay, all right. Before we would do this, we would do a couple of tests to make sure that circulation into the brain is efficient and okay. Actually, I remember now I have been adjusted and I have had those tests done before. Okay. So, okay, I forgot so for a second. So we're not gonna do that today. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then we would just do some range of motion again, right there. And I, any time I do some sort of a test, I always end with a distraction to help the patient forget what was done, if there was any kind of. Okay. So we're just gonna have a feel here. There's one right there, maybe. Yep. Okay. There you go. And again, before I would have done any of this in clinic, because we have a lot more time, you do a lot of soft tissue work. Can I do a couple of examples? Yeah, sure, that? absolutely. I'm just gonna lower the headpiece. There you go, you can lower your head. So, I would go and palpate the trapezius muscle, which is pretty tight in there. And then deeper to that would be the levator scapulae. And one of my favorite techniques is pin and stretch. So I would go in and pin the muscle, shorten it, and then stretch it out. And then I always add a, a little bit more to it. Dr. Nick, with your left hand, can I get it on the side of your, yeah. You're just gonna gently reach for your toes now, just to add a little bit of a stretch. So <laughs> I would do a lot of that muscle work first, and then go ahead and adjust him. Okay, all right, round of applause, good stuff. Okay. For people who haven't done it before, it looks intimidating. In fact, Chaz, let's get you to share. That's one of the reasons that I picked her as a, as a student, besides the fact that she's so good at it, is her initial, how she went through this. Yep. Um, so when I, at the end of second year, I had a low back injury. It was a central disc herniation. Um, and 
It took me a long time to recover from it. I had to teach myself to walk again, to tie my shoelaces again. I couldn't write any of my exams without sitting down. And it was right around the time when we were going for cadaver lab, so sitting in a car for three hours going down to Seattle was excruciating. Um, and then when we came back from that, I was still recovering and still apprehensive about people, you know, assessing my spine. And, you know, I sat down with Dr. Nick and we talked about it and he coached me through it and said that, you know, we're going to go at your pace and, uh, you know, this really is about your learning and, you know, within about a month it became a passion and I have no issues with adjusting anymore. It's really my favorite thing to do. Yeah, so cadaver labs are a requirement for graduation for uh, any medical practitioner and what we do is we take you down, this year we're going actually to Portland, and we take you down for a one week intensive dissection after we've done all of your anatomy and we've done all of your physical medicine so you'll be able to recognize the pathologies and all of the instructors, instructors, hopefully they're not cadavers, all right, <laughs> okay. all of the structures and pathologies on that uh, specimen that we have to look at there. So it actually gets you, most medical programs when they do it, they do here's your classroom time, here's your lab time. Classroom time, lab time. So we do all the lab time at the end while you have a better clinical picture of things that you might want to look at. So within, like say, like an everyday clinical interaction with a patient, how often does physical medicine become sort of a primary tool that you use? I know it depends on the practitioner. Yeah, 100% it depends on the practitioner, but if you decide to use it, I will, I will say to you that I could take everybody in this room right now and lay you down on this table and find something that we could improve on. Okay, something that we could work on. Yeah, exactly, 100%. It is a core fundamental principle. Some of our key instructors, one key instructor I, instructor I can think of specifically who practiced in Northern BC, Dr. Bob Van Orlick, he was specific physical medicine for everybody is what he did, okay? He did a lot more stuff beyond that because the scope of a naturopathic physician gives you more than that with the pharmacology and, you know, you name it, botanical medicine, homeopathy, T TAM, and all that kind of stuff. But it is a core fundamental treatment that you have available to offer somebody. Okay, whether, the, whether you decide to do that, that's your option, but I will tell you guys right now, by the end of your third year, or fourth year, you'll be very good at most of this stuff. Okay, very, very good at it. All right? Yep? What is the difference between manipulation and torque release? Torque release is a, just a different form of manipulation where they're not actually using, this is called high velocity, low amplitude, so it means a quick thrust, very shallow depth. And what they're doing in torque release is usually a twisting kind of fascial movement. And you will actually have options for those too through Bowen therapy and other things like that that we teach as well. Or as secondary, post-secondary education that you can do on your own. Okay? okay? All right. You're learning these techniques, you're doing it all on each other and yep. usually in the classroom. For sure, yeah. On, on, on each other and on other instructors as well. So just like I did for Shaz here, we'll have, I have uh, eight other doctors that work with me through this stuff and we all go through and we'll lay down. The best feedback you're going to get is, is if you set up on somebody who, who does it and you do it to them so they can show you exactly, no, this hand needs to be off a little bit, this hand needs to be on. I mean, what Shaz showed you, it was not like this when you started, right? It, it's very awkward, it's very clumsy, all right? It's something that you're looking at the apex of what she's learned right here. The next thing is uh, evidence-based medicine, okay? So what we're working towards and what most professions should be working towards is supporting their, ev supporting their treatments with evidence. So having population-based studies that show when I do this treatment, I get this result, okay? Or this is the risk of negative outcome with this result. The same, they do that for surgeries like crazy. You look at a surgery for this, this patient age group with this surgeon doing the job, what am I gonna expect to see for the outcomes for it? And they give you a, an array of injury for that, okay? Yeah, okay? Yep. Would there ever come a point where you would have to refer to a chiropractor? It depends on the practitioner, okay? If I've seen practitioners who are really good who actually do all their own adjusting. Other practitioners, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe you just have weakness of the shoulder so you can't push as hard or maybe you just don't feel comfortable doing cervical adjusting and you want to pass it off to somebody else or better yet, maybe you're in a multidisciplinary clinic where there is a chiropractor in there with you and you would say, you know what? I'm going to focus more on hormone balancing and women's health. I'm going to give my adjusting patients over to you, and there'll be a, an inter-office referral back and forth that way. Okay? Or even, if, yeah, if you wanted, you could refer to another naturopath that you know that does the adjusting as well, right? Don't think it just has to be, yeah. Okay? What do I know for naturopaths when they graduate from this program? I get people pretty excited and gung-ho about adjust, 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 and I'd say maybe 30% of them actually use it. Okay? But it's totally your option. There's nothing right or wrong with that. It's just what you decide to focus on. It can be a very hard way to practice on your body. So physically, the doctor themselves can wear themselves out if they're not using the appropriate techniques. And we kind of talk about how to modify your body position and biomechanics to improve or decrease injury rates in the physician. Okay, all right. Other questions? 
Yep. When you're looking at treatment of pathologies, like yep. or let's say your injury, would you be looking at a multifaceted approach right Absolutely. away? So you're looking at, well, what can we do, you know, with homeopathy plus I use physical maintenance? Okay, so everything. Yeah. And that's, that, the teaching. that's the whole core of this. That's the whole core of this program. This program is multidisciplinary integration is what we do here. So it's not just. I'm going to have my blinders on a little bit and be phys med focused, but you're going to have other people who are homeopathy, who are botanical medicine, who are TAM, who are going to be rehab exercises. You name it, you have the opportunity to pull that in here. Okay? And one thing I would suggest where medicine is going, most of us are going to be becoming specialists in a certain area, but being in that integrated multidisciplinary clinic is going to give you those other physicians to bounce ideas off of. I'll show you guys this really quick. So here's just kind of a sample for you to look at of just for educational hours for different professions, basically. <laughs> So what we did is we went online and we looked at the academic calendars for different institutions. I basically picked this, the top performing institutions based on board scores in uh, North America. So we went to the University of Western States. These are just in alphabetical order. For chiropractors, so it's University of Western States. There's Turo Osteopathic. There's Yale Medical for MDs. And we went into BINM. We pretty much have the best board exam scores. And then PT is Queen's University and then RMT, well, West Coast College and VCC both have pretty good scores. Uh, so these ones right here, this is your doctor comparison. What do you guys notice overall about the doctor hours that you get? Medical doctor, naturopathic doctor, osteopathic doctor, chiropractor, what do you get? Pretty much the same hours overall in education. It's where you spend those hours that makes the difference here, okay? So if we scroll down, what can I see? An hours of anatomy education. Why do you see so many chiros teaching anatomy? This is why. They spend a lot of time learning about anatomy, okay? Uh, pretty impressed with the RMT hours of anatomy. Well, that's pretty good for a basic degree, I would say, okay? Physiology. This is where NDs shine right here. Look at how much time you spend on physiology. And it's not just physiology. It's actually integration of, excuse me, <coughs> integration of pharmacology, pathology, physiology, embryology, all together. So when you're looking at it, just like we do with the anatomy, you integrate and get clinical application of that information right off the bat. Okay? It's not a separate mental separation of how do I apply this or what is this information for. You bring it together. Uh, orthopedics, well, I mean, that's what chiros kind of specialize in is outpatient orthopedics. So that's why you see higher numbers there. Next thing chiros do is, us, is uh, diagnostic imaging, so, which is something we teach you guys as well. I would figure that the most rehab and exercise education is going to be with physical therapists. I mean, that's just a given. That's what they specialize in. I would expect the person who's going to spend the most time with soft tissue mobilization is going to be a massage therapist, right? Okay, almost 700 hours there. Uh, adjusting time, that's just kind of how we rate. I mean, that's what chiropractors do is adjusting. Electrotherapeutics, that's things like ultrasound, stuff like that. Uh-oh, naturopathic doctor, where am I spending my time? Botanical medicine and nutrition, okay? This is kind of fundamental information, you would think, as being a healthcare provider. I should know about nutrition. This, these are their institutions, and there is none of it there. Okay? All right. Uh, pharmacology hours. You have the same pharmacology hours, believe it or not, as a medical doctor. You have to write and pass the same exams in order to pres prescribe uh, medications. The only difference is there's limitation in BC. The limitation is that you're not allowed to prescribe narcotic analgesics due to the addictive properties of the medications. Okay? Everything else is exactly the same. In the previous group, we actually had a pharmacist in here, and he says he has natu naturopathic doctors call in and say, I would like this antibiotic for this patient, and that's all you have to do. Okay? And then surgical hours, of course, just to keep it a balanced picture. That's what a lot of MDs spend their time doing, so you'd expect that they would spend more hours doing that. Okay? Minor surgery was, is within your scope, but that's where you kind of draw the line. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>